Part two, chapter nine of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Return to Paris. The summer of seventeen ninety nine passed without anything unusual. Lady Jerningham was again settled at Cossey, where she had invited me to rejoin her and pass the six months of her sojourn in the country. The lease of our house at Richmond, which she had taken for us, was on the point of expiring, and it would have been hardly considerate on our part to ask her to renew it, with the view of not accepting the hospitality which she had offered us. My aunt was alone at Cossey. Her niece, Fanny Dillon, my cousin, whom she had brought up, had just married Sir Thomas Webb, a Catholic baronet, who was quite an ordinary man, although very well born. Her eldest son, George Jerningham, had also married a Miss Sulliard, a very beautiful young lady belonging to an old and noble Catholic family. William Jerningham was in Germany. Her favourite son, Edward, had not left her, and that was all that was necessary. Under these circumstances, it would have been a real disgrace for us not to go to Cossy. We were making our preparations accordingly to set out, when there arrived the news of the unexpected return from Egypt of General Bonaparte, who had landed at Fréjus. On learning of this event, we left at once for Cossy with the hope of being able soon to go over to the continent and perhaps to return to France. It was during our sojourn there that we received the happy news of the fall of the Directory and of the revolution of 18 Brumaire. Some time later, we received letters from Monsieur de Brocan and our brother-in-law, the Marquis de la Mette, urging us to return to France by way of Holland, with German passports. Lady Jerningham proposed that my husband should leave alone. This would perhaps have been better on account of the state of my health, but no consideration could determine me to be separated from my husband for an indefinite time. The communications between England and France in time of war might be entirely interrupted. The news which we received from Hamburg was often a month old. So we rejected all the propositions of Lady Jerningham. A Danish passport was sent from London for my husband, my children and myself. We set out for Yarmouth with the idea of taking passage on a packet of the Royal Navy. At this time there were no steamboats. Our wait at Yarmouth was prolonged during the whole month of December. We did not dare to return to Cossey, although the distance was only 18 miles, as the captain had declared that as soon as the wind became favourable, that is to say from the southeast, he would sail immediately. He would hardly consent to let us remain on land, as he was in such haste to leave as soon as possible. Every courier brought dispatches from the government. Never had I passed such tedious days as during the month we were at Yarmouth. We were living in a very poor lodging with two rooms. We were not able to go out, for the weather was frightful. The contrary winds blew with fury. Every day the reports of vessels which had been lost. You can imagine how such news was of a nature to discourage persons who might be called upon to embark at any moment. Finally, one morning, they came to inform us that it was necessary to go on board, where our baggage had been already for a long time. Hardly had we set foot on deck when the anchor was lifted. The sea was very rough, and we had a very disagreeable passage, which lasted 48 hours. About the middle of the second night, we were for some hours uncertain as to whether or not we might be left on Heligoland, a little island off the mouth of the Elbe, in case the current did not loosen the ice. The captain subsequently declared that, on account of the violent weather, if the wind had veered a single point to the north, he would have been forced to return to England without attempting to land. Fortunately, we escaped both of these eventualities. After having passed the island of Heligoland, we entered the Elbe and moored in the offing of the little port of Cuxhaven, which we did not enter. The captain was in haste to be relieved of his passengers. 
everything was thrown pell-mell into the longboat my husband and my maid left with my son as for myself the captain on account of the state of my health put me with my little girl in his private boat and ordered the two sailors to land me as near as possible to the city this injunction was nearly fatal to me the tide being low when we came alongside the jetty i found much difficulty in landing the two sailors seized me then by the wrists and in spite of the motion of the boat they would not let go fortunately for i certainly should have fallen into the sea then they hoisted me on the jetty in such a manner that for several moments i was suspended by the arms they left me then alone with my little charlotte although i was feeling very ill i was forced nevertheless to set out to meet my husband whom i perceived at a distance in a small wagon in which were our baggage and my maid i felt a violent pain in my right side and i have always thought since that i suffered some internal injury we were obliged to knock at the door of two or three inns without being able to find a lodging on account of the number of emigres who were leaving for or arriving from england finally we succeeded in persuading one innkeeper to give us temporary quarters a few moments later i was taken with a violent fever and was out of my head my husband who was very anxious sent for a doctor after a long search they brought back one who did not speak a word of french he applied a plaster to my side and ordered me a calming draught which caused me to sleep continuously for twenty-four hours on waking up i felt all right again while i was asleep my husband had purchased for two hundred francs a little old caleche which was sufficiently spacious to contain us all after a second day of repose we set out in this open carriage in the month of january in the north of germany fortunately the weather was favourable the first days of our journey the fourth day a torrential rain did not cease to fall marguerite and i were somewhat protected by the back of the caleche but my husband and my son in spite of an umbrella were wet to the skin we remained two days at bremen to dry our clothes behind the fine large stoves which you find in the german houses and also to obtain a little repose then the weather became fine and we again set out much snow had fallen and it was difficult to distinguish the route in the plains of heather which we were traversing towards evening we arrived at the little city of wildeshausen where we were to pass the night it was situated in the electorate of hanover and had consequently a hanoverian garrison the officers that day were giving a great ball to another regiment which was passing through all the rooms of the only inn in the locality were occupied we found refuge in the vestibule near the stove and were very sad over the prospect of passing the night upon the wooden benches when an officer all dressed for the ball came gallantly to say to me in english that as he was to pass the whole night at the ball he would place his room at my disposal there we went for supper a little later i was taken very ill and the proprietor of the hotel sent a messenger to the end of the city to awaken an old hairdresser a frenchman by origin who had been settled at wildeshausen since the seven years war he arrived very promptly as he had not yet gone to bed on account of the ball his first care was to run in search of a physician who lived in the vicinity the doctor an elegant young man arrived wearing white gloves he had left the ball and was still out of breath from his last waltz his acquaintance with the french language comprised only several medical phrases the old perruquier denis fortunately came to our rescue to explain the nature of my malady he asked if i could be transported without trouble to two rooms which he knew were to let at the end of the city the doctor consented and then returned to the ball denis ran to awaken the proprietor of these rooms and before daybreak i was settled there 
the house like all those of the prosperous peasants of this part of germany had a large porte cochere by which you entered a large carriage house which occupied the whole depth of the house in front at right and left of this carriage house on the ground floor were two good rooms very neat and quite well furnished marguerite and my two children took one while i was placed in the larger room and my husband took possession of a small cabinet adjoining the following morning the thirteenth of february eighteen hundred was born my little girl to whom we gave the name of cecile the following day the bailiff of the locality who had already sent once in search of our passport dispatched one of the village guards to lead monsieur de la tour du pin to him he said to my husband in good french so your danish passport is under a false name you are french and an emigre and in the electorate of hanover where you are now it is forbidden to allow the sojourn of french emigres more than forty-eight hours my husband was terrified by this discourse he alleged that i was not in a state to be transported but the bailiff was inflexible as to the departure of my husband and declared that before the end of the day he must take his choice between leaving for hanover and returning to bremen then he added sir since you acknowledge that you are french let me know your real name la tour du pain ha oh, mon dieu cried the bailiff are you the former minister of france to the hague exactly well sir if this is so remain here as long as you wish my nephew monsieur inuba a very young man was minister of hanover at the hague he often visited your house and you were very kind to him from this moment he placed himself at our disposal with the greatest zeal in two weeks i was up again and at the end of another week we set out after having taken tea with the bailiff the burgomaster and the curate as there was a catholic church at wildeshausen my little daughter was baptized there she was held at the font by the old perruquier and his wife who during the forty years of their marriage had never learned a word of french we took the route of lingen to enter holland for several leagues we were accompanied by a number of young men before leaving they insisted that i should drink a cup of a german mixture of which they had prepared the ingredients i thought it would be detestable but nevertheless after having tasted it i found the beverage delicious it was composed of warm bordeaux wine in which they had put yolks of eggs and spices the doctor was among those who had accompanied me and it was by his advice that i swallowed this mixture which somewhat inebriated me the worthy fellows of our escort then left us and wished us with fervour a bon voyage their wish brought us good fortune for nothing troublesome happened and my little girl endured the trip in an astonishing manner for a baby who was not a month old we finally arrived at utrecht and my husband went at once to the hague in order to obtain a passport en règle from the ambassador of the french republic monsieur de semonville the latter who turned with each wind which blew had already succeeded in pleasing the new government of which bonaparte was the head my husband had known monsieur de semonville very intimately for a long time so he was received with open arms and they fabricated for him a superb passport attesting that he had not left utrecht since the eighteen fructidor during the short absence of monsieur de la tour du pin madame denis by the merest chance passed through utrecht and my husband was very much surprised to find his aunt on his return from his trip to the hague i think that madame denis was on her way to see monsieur de lafayette who had been living at Vianen near Utrecht since his release from prison after the peace of Campo Formio. I do not recall whether she had come from France or England. She always had two or three passports and changed her name and her route at every moment. 
we remained two days with her and then taking advantage of a carriage which was being sent to paris and which we were charged to deliver at its destination we set out on arriving at paris we stopped at the hotel grange batelier my brother-in-law lamette and our friend bruquin were at paris monsieur de lamette installed us in a charming little house entirely furnished rue de miramini which had been occupied prior to that by two or three friends who had just left to go and pass the whole summer in the country we were predestined to live in the houses of courtesans that at richmond belonged to an actress this one had been arranged for mademoiselle michelot former mistress of the duc de bourbon all the walls were ornamented with mirrors with such prodigality that i was obliged to hang pieces of muslin to conceal the greater part of them and i was much annoyed at not being able to move without encountering my form reflected from head to foot at paris i found many persons of my acquaintance who had already returned from the emigration all the young people from this moment turned their eyes towards the rising sun madame bonaparte who was installed at the tuileries where the apartments had been entirely refurnished as if by enchantment she already put on the airs of a queen but of a queen the most gracious the most amiable the most kind-hearted although she had very little intelligence she had nevertheless well penetrated the projects of her husband the first consul had given his wife the mission of bringing to him la haute société having been persuaded by josephine that she belonged to it which was not strictly true i do not know whether she had ever been presented at court or visited at versailles but thanks to the name of her first husband monsieur de Beauharnais, the thing was certainly possible during the years seventeen eighty seven to seventeen ninety one i met monsieur de Beauharnais constantly in society as he had seen my husband frequently when he was aide de camp of monsieur de bouille during the war in america monsieur de Beauharnais said to him one day come and see me so that i may present you to my wife my husband went there once but never went again the society which met in their salon was not ours monsieur de beauharnais nevertheless went everywhere for during the war he had formed ties with a number of leaders of high society he had a charming figure and had the reputation justly of being the finest dancer in paris i had often danced with him and i therefore experienced a very painful feeling when i heard of his death on the scaffold I again saw Monsieur de Talleyrand, who was always animated by the same sentiments towards me, amiable, without being really useful. During the past two years he had worked so successfully at increasing his fortune that I found him settled in a beautiful house, his personal property, in the Rue d'Anjou. He laughed in his sleeve at the disposition on the part of all those who had returned to France to rally to the government he said to me que fait gouverne veut-il quelque chose non i replied nous comptons aller nous installer à bouy tant pis he exclaimed c'est une bêtise mais i replied nous ne sommes pas en état de rester à paris bah, he said on a toujours de l'argent quand on veut voila l'homme as soon as madame bonaparte learned through madame de valence and madame de montesson of my presence in paris she wished to come and see me to draw to her a woman still young a former lady of honour very much in vogue would be a conquest if i dare say so of which she was very impatient to boast to the first consul in order to give value to my condescension i allowed myself to be implored a little then one morning i went with madame de valence to call on madame bonaparte i found in the salon a number of ladies and a group of young men all of whom i knew madame bonaparte came to me crying ah la voila 
she seated me beside her and said a thousand pleasant things repeating all the time comme elle l'air anglais which ceased to be a praiseworthy tray a short time later she examined me from head to foot and her attention was particularly drawn to a tress of blonde hair which surrounded my head and from which her eyes could not be drawn as we rose to leave she could not refrain from demanding in a low tone of madame de valence if this tress was indeed my own hair madame bonaparte spoke to me with much kindness of madame dillon my stepmother and expressed a warm desire to make the acquaintance of my sister fanny who was at the same time her cousin the mother of madame dillon and of josephine having been sisters then she continued by saying all the emigres were going to return and that she was charmed and that they had suffered enough and that general bonaparte wished above everything else to bring to an end the evils of the revolution and so on in short a lot of reassuring statements she also asked for news of monsieur de la tour du pin and evinced a desire of seeing him she was leaving for ma maison and invited me to come there she was very pleasant in every way and i saw clearly that the first consul had entrusted to her the department of the ladies of the court and the task of their conquest when she met them the task was not very difficult for all were rushing towards the rising power and i did not know anyone except myself who refused to be lady of honour to the empress josephine monsieur de la tour du pin and i had never been inscribed i cannot explain why upon the list of emigres it was necessary however for us to obtain a certificate of residence in france signed by nine witnesses an indispensable formality of which nevertheless no one was dupe with this end we went to the municipality of the quarter with our squad of witnesses when the certificate was signed and clothed with all the necessary mensonges the mayor said to me in a low tone that does not prevent you from bringing from london all your effects then he began to laugh what a comedy the place in paris during this summer where the most distinguished company was brought together was under the arch of a house in the place de vendome that which forms the angle of the place on the right in going towards the rue saint honore and on the side of that street it was there that the commission of the emigres held its sessions a tribunal very easy to conciliate if you did not come with empty hands in the crowds which assembled at this point you met the greatest personages mingled with brokers of every kind the french find amusement in everything the commission of emigres had become a place of reunions people made appointments there they went there to meet former acquaintances to talk over their plans their choice of residence many of those who came back considered the place as an employment bureau we had no business with this commission as we did not figure on the list of emigres it was necessary however to have erased from this list the name of my mother-in-law although she had resided for thirty years in the convent of the dame anglaise of the rue des fosses saint victor which she had never left they had nevertheless inscribed her name the sale of all the furniture of the chateau of tesson and of the two farmhouses had been the consequence of this unjustifiable inscription one morning i went to malmaison it was after the battle of marengo madame bonaparte gave me a wonderful reception and after luncheon which was served in a charming salle a manger she invited me to see her picture gallery we were alone and she took advantage of the occasion to tell me the story of the origin of the masterpieces which the gallery contained this fine picture had been presented to her by the pope two others had been given her by canova the city of milan had offered her this picture and that 
having a great admiration for the conqueror of Marengo, I should have esteemed Madame Bonaparte more highly if she had told me that all these masterpieces had been conquered at the point of his sword. The good woman was naturally a liar. Even when the simple truth would have been more interesting and more piquant than a lie, she would have preferred to lie. Madame de Stael had given up her house. Her husband had returned to Sweden, where he died two years later. After having settled in a small apartment, she was preparing to go to join her father at Coppe. Bonaparte could not endure her, though she tried in every way to please him. I think that she never went to see Madame Bonaparte. One day, however, I met Josephine Bonaparte in her salon. She received people of all the regimes. The émigrés returned to France, mingled at her house with the former partisans of the directory. End of Part 2 Chapter 9Part 2, Chapter 10 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 10, 1800 to 1808. Life at Le Buil. Finally, about the month of September, we decided to leave for Le Buil. About three years before, we had sold our house in Paris at a very low price. It was situated in a bad quarter, the Rue du Bac. I no longer remember the disposition which my husband made of the proceeds of this sale. On his return, he found the affairs of his father as well as his own in such great disorder and he was so unfortunate in everything he undertook that in spite of his intelligence and his capacity he did not seem to succeed in anything my husband set out alone for tesson and i engaged a driver who took me home by short journeys in a large carriage which held besides myself my son my two daughters the instructor monsieur de cologne and my maid marguerite we finally arrived at Le Buil, where I was happy to be once more. I had great need of repose. An excellent girl, whom I had left there, had taken care of everything in good shape. My husband arrived a few days later, and we finally found ourselves all reunited in our home. My husband devoted himself to agriculture and the education of his son, in which I assisted, in order that he should not forget his English. Humbert was then ten and a half years of age, while Charlotte was four and Cécile six months. My excellent maid Marguerite devoted herself with as much attention and tenderness to the dear children as I did myself. A short time after our arrival at Le Buil, a cousin of my husband, Madame de Morville, came to stay with us. She had lost all the property which she possessed in France, and her principal resource was a pension of forty pounds sterling paid to her by the English government. This had been given her as the widow of a general officer of the French navy who had taken service with England. A thing which I may say in passing was very villainous. Madame de Morville was very fond of Monsieur La Tour du Pin. She was four years older than he and had known him since his childhood. She was very happy to be with us. Madame Denin came to Le Buil on several occasions during the eight years we resided there. At the time of her first visit, which lasted several months, she brought Elisa, the daughter of Monsieur Lally who had just left the school of Madame Campan. I was asked to undertake finishing her education. Mademoiselle de Lally at that time was fifteen years of age, and I received her with pleasure. She was a sweet, good child, quite well grounded in orthography, music and dancing, while the cultivation of her mind had been almost completely neglected. 
I looked at the mission which had been confided to me as a heavy charge and a great responsibility to take. Nevertheless, my husband urged me to accept, and his wish for me was a law against which the thought of resisting never occurred to me. As we were not in a state of fortune easily to increase our expenses, my aunt arranged that Monsieur de Lally should pay us, as pension for his daughter, a sum equivalent to that which he had paid for her with Madame Rampon. To accept such a condition seemed to me a backward step on our part. Nevertheless, we submitted. Besides this, Monsieur de Lally undertook the charge of paying the personal expenses of his daughter. Elisa had no ground to complain of these arrangements, and I am able to say that we also had no reason to regret them. In assuming the education of Mademoiselle de Lally, I was only doing what it was necessary for me to undertake later on with my own daughters. My husband, for his part, undertook to teach her history and geography. I took charge of the English lessons, and the instructor of my son gave her lessons in Italian. Our reading aloud was also of benefit to her. She was very fond of my children, especially of Cécile, whose first education she began. We were preoccupied, my husband and I, with the future of our children, and this was not the least of the disquietudes which the bad state of our affairs caused us. The estate of Le Buil, reduced to its bare land value, represented very little. The war with England had reduced the price of wines to almost nothing, especially white wines already at this time of little value in our part of the country. This wine could then be bought at from four to five francs a barrel. My husband installed an equipment for making eau de vie and went to quite heavy expense to put this apparatus in working order. But the profits from this commerce permitted us at least to live. Soon it was necessary for us to think of the future of our son which was our principal concern. My aunt and Monsieur de Lally wrote us from Paris that all the persons whom we had formerly known had rallied to the government. The Concordat had just been published, and the re-establishment of religion had a prodigious effect in the provinces. Until this moment, divine services were only held in private rooms, if not entirely in secret, and the priests were almost always returned emigres. There was therefore universal joy when Monsieur W. de Sanzai, a man highly esteemed, was appointed Archbishop at Bordeaux. We had the honour of entertaining him at Le Buil during the first two days which followed his taking possession of the diocese. We brought together to receive him all the good cures of our former estate, which comprised nineteen parishes. The greater part, recently appointed, had returned from foreign countries. Others had been concealed with their parishioners or in private houses. Our archbishop was adored by all, and his entry into Bordeaux was a triumph. The gratitude which all felt went out to the great man who held the reins of government. When he proclaimed himself consul for life, this gratitude was shown by the almost unanimous approbation of those who were called upon to vote upon this proposition. A little later there appeared in the communes the lists upon which it was necessary for the voters to inscribe their names and respond by yes or no to the question as to whether the consul for life should be proclaimed emperor. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin was in a state of great indecision before he decided to write yes upon the list at saint andre de Cubzac. I saw him walk up and down alone in the garden, but I did not try to penetrate his thoughts. Finally, one evening, he entered and I learned with pleasure that he had just written yes, 
as a result of his reflections. In 1805, I went with Elise Lally to pass some time at Bordeaux. One day at Mass, Elisa was observed by a young man, the most distinguished in Bordeaux by birth, face and fortune, Monsieur Henri Do. Elisa was very small, but she had a superb head of black hair, very brilliant colour, the freshness of a rose, and the handsomest eyes in the world. Our friend Bourquin, after the loss of his fortune, caused by the failure of his company which furnished provisions for the army, had returned to take up his residence at Bordeaux for an indefinite time. He learned through friends that Monsieur Henri Dor had spoken in terms of eulogy to certain of his comrades of the young lady who was being brought up by Madame de la Tour du Pin, and declared that none of the young ladies of Bordeaux had so pleasant and agreeable a manner. He asked for information regarding us, a manner of life, and so on. My husband, who had been named President of the Canton, without having solicited the office, had gone to Paris for the coronation. I wrote him of the gossip which had been reported to me, and he spoke of it to Monsieur de Lally. The latter was then taken up with the endeavour to secure the repayment of quite a large sum of money which the state owed him since the rehabilitation of his father and the cancellation of his death penalty that is to say since three years before the revolution this indebtedness of the state had been recognized as valid by the council of state but the sum having been reduced two-thirds like all the funds did not amount to more than a hundred thousand francs napoleon who desired to rally Monsieur de Lally to his government, wished that the reclamation should be entirely successful. When my husband spoke to Monsieur de Lally of the contents of my letter, he declared without hesitation that, if he received this sum, he would give it to his daughter the day of her marriage. You will see how he kept his word. We arranged to go to Bordeaux for the carnival season, in order to give Monsieur Do the chance of seeing Elisa at the balls which were given in the salons of the former intendance. About this time, I had the great sorrow of losing our dear maid, Marguerite, whom I loved as a mother. This caused me very sincere grief. My husband had seen at Paris several persons of his acquaintance, all of whom had entered the service of the government, among them Monsieur Marais, afterwards Duc de Bassano. They urged him to attempt to obtain some employment. Without exactly refusing, he replied that if the Emperor wished to have his services, he well knew where he could find him, and that the role of a solicitor did not please him. Monsieur de Talleyrand could not comprehend reluctance of this kind, but he felt nevertheless in his mind rather than his heart that there was a sort of distinction in not mingling with the crowd of solicitors. He only said, shrugging his shoulders, Cela viendra, and then he thought no more about it. My husband returned to Le Bouil. He had seen Monsieur Malouet, who had just been named Préfet Maritime at Antwerp, in charge of the large shipyards there to which he gave so tremendous an impetus. These gentlemen had come to an understanding that when Humbert was seventeen years of age, he should receive a position in the office of Monsieur Malouet. The Institution des Auditeurs Conseil d'État was not then in existence. They had commenced, however, to talk of it, and we were of the opinion that it would be useful for a young man who was destined for business to work for a time under the eyes of a man as keen and competent as Monsieur Malouet. As he had much friendship for us, we could entrust our son to him with entire confidence. The thought of this separation, nevertheless, 
weighed heavily on my heart. The 18th of October, 1806, as I was dressing in the morning, I saw passing on the terrace our good Dr. Dupuis, who had been at Le Bouille for several days. I asked him laughingly where he had come from so early in the morning. He replied that he had just been to report the death of one of our neighbours, who had passed away suddenly in getting up that morning. I knew this person very well and had had a long talk with her only the evening before. This event upset me to such a degree that that very morning I gave birth to my youngest son, Amar, the only one of my children who is living at this writing. In the meantime, we had not lost sight of the important affair of the marriage of Elisa, under pretext of having our baby vaccinated, we went about Christmas time to pass six weeks at Bordeaux with our excellent friend Brucon. He had succeeded in winning to our side Monsieur de Mavotin de Couteneux, former Councillor of Parliament, the uncle of Monsieur Do. His wife, having been the sister of the mother of Monsieur Do, this young man, after the death of his mother, which happened a long time before, felt towards his aunt a real filial affection. Monsieur de Couteneux desired to re-enter the judicature, and Monsieur de Lagny was understood to have very good standing with the government. This was another reason which led Monsieur de Couteneux to favour the marriage of his nephew. Besides this, pride apart, we enjoyed such consideration of Bordeaux that a person admitted into our family life would have a certain standing. The young people met at several balls. They also met on the street and at church, where we were always sure to see Monsieur Do. Finally, one day, Madame de Couteneux presented herself officially at my house to ask for the hand of the young lady for her nephew. As a good old diplomatist, I replied that I was ignorant of the plans of Monsieur de Lally for his daughter, but that Monsieur de la Tour du Pin would go to see him at Le Bouille, where he was at the moment, and present the proposition to him. My husband went there, as arranged, and returned the following day with Monsieur de Lally. All was soon arranged. Then followed the congratulations, the dinners, the evening entertainments. We received a call from the aged father of Monsieur Do. He was a gentleman of the olden days, without the least vestige of intelligence or instruction. It was said that he had bored his wife to death. This did not prevent him, however, from possessing more than 60,000 francs of income. The day of the signature of the contract, Monsieur de Lally counted out for Monsieur Do, as he had agreed, a hundred bags of 1,000 francs, representing the Do of his daughter. It was the only time in my life that I ever saw so much money at one time. The marriage took place at Le Bouille, the 1st of April, 1807. At this season there were no flowers except little pink and white marguerites. Madame de Morville, Charlotte and I constructed a charming Ypern for the dinner, the bottom of which was of moss with the names of Henri and Elisa written in flowers. All these preliminaries and the marriage itself had very much upset me and taken me out of my tranquil and regular habits. I was therefore very glad to return home to enjoy the last months which my son was to pass with us. My aunt and Monsieur de Lally returned to Paris and I remained alone with Madame de Mauville. End of part two, chapter ten. Part two, chapter eleven of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1808, the Emperor at Bordeaux. Bordeaux was very much taken up with the affairs of Spain and several refugees from that country had already arrived there. 
my aunt wrote us from paris that the emperor was to go to spain accompanied perhaps by the empress josephine and that monsieur de bassano would form part of his suite she advised her nephew to pay his court to the emperor and to see monsieur de bassano who was interested in him my husband received this letter at the moment when he was setting out on horseback for tesson a matter of business absolutely claimed his presence there in leaving he said that he would be gone only two days and that he had plenty of time to go and return the very next day the order was received at the posting station to prepare horses for the emperor this news filled me with despair but i was none the less anxious to see this extraordinary man madame de morville my daughter charlotte and i went to cubzac resolved not to return before we had seen napoleon we demanded hospitality from ribet the grand commissionnaire de transport who knew us and who installed us in a room looking out on the port the brigantine destined for the passage of the dodogne was already there with the sailors at their posts the whole population of the country lined the road the peasants while cursing the man who took their children to send them away to war wished to see him nevertheless a first courier arrived people tried to question him general drouet delon the commander of the department asked him when the emperor would arrive the man was so fatigued that the only response they could get from him was the word passant his horse was saddled he accompanied it on the boat then fell at the bottom of the boat like a dead man and it was necessary to rouse him and put him on his horse on the other side of the river after the passage of the courier our impatience was very great as for myself i was taken up with the fatality which kept my husband far from the place where his functions demanded his presence the municipality of Cubzac was present and he the president of the canton whose place was there was absent it was an occasion lost which might not return i felt very much put out finally after a wait which lasted the entire day towards evening a first carriage arrived and a little later a berlin with eight horses escorted by a picket of cavalry stopped under the window where we were the emperor descended dressed in the uniform of chasseur de la garde two chamberlains one of whom was monsieur de barral and an aide-de-camp accompanied him the mayor paid his compliments the emperor listened with an air of great boredom then entered the brigantine which immediately set out this was all we saw of the great man we returned to Le Bouille, all three of us, tired out and in bad humour. The next day my husband arrived. I gave him only time to eat his breakfast and then forced him to set out for Bordeaux, where the Empress was expected the next day. Immediately on his arrival he went to see Monsieur Marais, who professed for him much friendship and interest. He found him kind and obliging, what was his astonishment when Monsieur de Marais said to him, You have felt much annoyance over the necessity of going to Tesson exactly at the time that the Emperor was passing your home, and you have shown great diligence in returning. You have then seen Bouquin, replied Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. No. But then how do you know all that? The Emperor told me. You can imagine how much my husband was surprised. Madame de la Tour du Pin should come to Bordeaux, added Monsieur Marais. She should remain here during the time of the sojourn of the Empress. There will be an assembly tomorrow, and the Emperor wishes that she should be present. My husband immediately sent a carriage for me, for it was not a time to hesitate. I had several dresses at Bordeaux, made at the time that I was taking Elisa to the balls, and to evening entertainments given at the time of her marriage but among these there was no black dress and the court was in mourning 
The assembly was for eight o'clock and it was already five. Fortunately, I had a pretty robe of grey satin. I added several dark ornaments. The good coiffure arranged some black ribbons in my hair. And this seemed to me very appropriate for a woman of thirty-eight who can say without vanity that she did not have the air of being more than thirty. The reunion was in the large salle à manger of the palace. I knew very few persons at Bordeaux. Sixty or eighty ladies were present. We were arranged according to a list read aloud by the Chamberlain, Monsieur de Bayan. He enjoined us that no one was to leave her place under any pretext, as otherwise it would be impossible for him to find the name to give to each person. This sort of military manoeuvre had hardly been arranged when a loud voice announced, L'Empereur! which caused my heart to beat. He began at the end of the line and addressed a word to each lady. As he approached the place where I was standing, the Chamberlain said a word in his ear. He fixed his eyes on me, smiling graciously, and when my turn came he said to me, laughing in a familiar tone, while he regarded me from head to foot, Why, you are not then afflicted over the death of the King of Denmark? Not sufficiently, sire, I replied, to sacrifice the pleasure of being presented to your majesty. I had no black dress. Oh, that is an excellent reason. And then he added, you were in the country. Speaking then to the lady beside me, he said, your name, madame? She stammered, and he did not comprehend. Montesquieu, I said. Ah, oh, really, that is a fine name to have. I went this morning to La Bred to see the cabinet of Montesquieu. The poor woman replied, thinking that she had found a fine inspiration. C'est un bon citoyen. This word, citoyen, displeased the emperor. He gave Madame de Montesquieu with his eagle eyes a look which would have terrified her if she had understood, and replied very briskly, Menon said it en grand homme. And then, shrugging his shoulders, he looked at me as if to say, Que cette femme est bête. The empress followed at some distance behind the emperor, and the ladies were named to her in the same order. But before she arrived at my place, the valet de chambre came to request me to go to the salon to await her majesty. When the empress entered the salon, she showed herself very amiable for me, and for my husband, whom she had also summoned. She expressed the desire to see me every evening during her sojourn at Bordeaux, and then began to play backgammon with Monsieur de La Tour du Pin. They served tea and ices. I was still in hopes of seeing the Emperor again, and my disappointment was great when I learned that upon the arrival of a courier from Bayonne, he had immediately left Bordeaux to go there. The Emperor, having all Spain and all Europe on his hands, to use the common expression, had nevertheless the time to dictate the order of the day of the Empress in the most minute detail, even to the toilettes which she was to wear. She would neither have wished nor dared to change this in the slightest particular, unless she was sick in bed. I learned from Madame Marais that the Emperor had ordered that we should come, my husband and I, every day to pass the evening, which we did. However, the poor Empress was beginning to be cruelly disturbed over the rumours of divorce, which were already being circulated. She spoke of it to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, who reassured her as well as possible. He endeavoured to stop the confidences which the imprudent and light-headed Josephine seemed disposed to make to him, and which it seemed to him indiscreet to hear. She was much turned against Monsieur de Talleyrand, whom she accused of urging the Emperor to obtain a divorce. No one was better aware of this fact than my husband, for he had talked the matter over with him during the trip he made to Paris, but he took care not to let Josephine know this. Accustomed to the adulation of some, the deception of others, she found great relief in talking with my husband, 
and opened her heart to him on a subject which she had not dared to broach to any persons of her entourage she was very desirous of leaving for bayonne and demanded every day of ordinaire when do we go to which he replied with his german accent indeed i do not yet know one evening i was seated beside the empress at the tea-table when she received a note of several lines from the emperor leaning towards me she said very low he writes like a cat i cannot read this last phrase at the same time she handed me the note while putting her finger upon her lips as a sign of mystery i had only the time to read several thous of these and then the last phrase thus worded i have here the father and the son this gives me much embarrassment since then this note has been quoted in a dispatch but much amplified there were only five or six lines written upon a sheet of paper which had been torn and folded in two if it were shown to me i should recognize it after tea general ordener approached the empress and said to her your majesty will leave tomorrow at midday at this decision everyone rejoiced the surgeon at bordeaux had been a cause of expense for me as it had been necessary during the ten days to be in full dress every evening i was crazy to return to my children elisa on account of her baby was not able to come to see the empress to her great regret she had been present only at the assembly where she received a very flattering reception her husband had entered the mounted guard of honour which was composed of all the most distinguished young men of bordeaux we returned accordingly to le bouille and notwithstanding the fine reception from the distinguished personages whom we had seen at bordeaux we entertained only small hopes for the future how could i believe indeed that a man averse to all intrigue unknown so to speak to those in power since he had not mingled in any of the events for the past few years living retired at his chateau in a retreat all the more profound because he was almost without fortune how could i suppose i say that he should have attracted the eye of the eagle who was the master of the destinies of france my husband had remained at bordeaux to finish some business and i was seated beside my lamp talking with my poor cousin madame joseph de la tour du pin whom we had received at our house through kindness at this moment as nine o'clock was striking a peasant sent expressly from bordeaux arrived with a note from my husband in which were written only these words i am prefect of brussels of brussels only ten leagues from antwerp i admit that i experienced a great joy in which the thought of again seeing my son touched me above all Monsieur Marais was ignorant of the vacancy in this prefecture. The papers of the Minister of the Interior arrived at Bayonne exactly as if he had been present at the Tuileries or at Saint Cloud. For nothing was allowed to change the habits of the Emperor. He was upsetting the Spanish monarchy and sending to prison or into exile the two kings, father and son. This gave him quote much embarrassment as i had read written in his own hand but in spite of that when the work of the minister arrived he read rectified and changed the nominations prefecture de la deal a name is proposed for this post he takes his pen erases it and writes above it la tour du pain that is what we learn later from monsieur marais who never raised any objection but who also never made any proposition he was a very useful machine my son was at antwerp seated at his desk as secretary to monsieur malouet when he saw the latter running across the court never had any one seen monsieur malouet the most dignified of men hasten his pace for any reason whatsoever on entering he cried your father is prefet of brussels dear Ambert, how great was his joy 
Several days before the departure of my husband from Le Wheel to go to Brussels, I received a courier in great haste from our friend Bruquin, who announced that he had sent a carriage to Cubzac. He informed me at the same time that King Charles the Fourth of Spain and his unworthy wife were to arrive at Bordeaux at the palace, and that the Emperor had given orders that I should serve as a lady of honour to the Queen during her sojourn at Bordeaux, which would be for two or three days. Fortunately, all my ceremonial costumes were still with Monsieur de Brocain. My packing was therefore soon finished. My husband accompanied me, and we set out. Arrived at Bordeaux, I dressed hastily and went to the palace, where their Spanish majesties had just arrived. On entering the salon, I found some gentlemen of my acquaintance who cried, Come at once, we are awaiting you for dinner. This was very agreeable to me, for I had taken only a cup of tea before leaving. The king and queen had retired to their own apartment with the Prince de la Paix. I met Monsieur Dodenard and Monsieur de Monnois, the one Ecuyer, the other Chamberlain to the Emperor, a few others, and two or three Spaniards, whose names I did not know and who did not speak French. We immediately sat down to dinner. These gentlemen told me two other ladies of honour had been named, one of whom was Elisa Do, and I was charged to notify them to be at the palace the next day at midday. The next day at eleven o'clock I went to the palace, and Monsieur de Monnoir requested to enter the Queen's apartment to present me. Turning to me before opening the door, he said, Don't laugh. This, of course, gave me a desire to, and in truth there was sufficient reason. There I saw the most surprising and unexpected spectacle. La Reine d'Espagne s'était au milieu de la chambre devant une grande psyché, ou la lacée. Elle avait pour tout vêtement une petite jupe de percale très étroite et très courte, et sur la poitrine, la plus sèche, la plus déchaînée, la plus noire que l'on pût voir, un mouchoir de gaz. Sous ses cheveux gris était disposée en guise de coiffure une guirlande de roses rouge et jaune. La reine s'avança vers moi, la femme de chambre, la laçon toujours, en opérant ces mouvements de cour que l'on fait quand on veut, en termes de toilette, se retirer de son corset. Near her was the king and several other men whom I did not know. The queen demanded of Monsieur de Monnoir, who is that lady? He told her. What is her name? She said. He repeated it. And the Queen addressed several words in Spanish to the King, who replied by saying that I was, or that my name was, very noble. Then the Queen finished her toilette while relating that the Empress had given her several of her dresses, as she had brought none from Madrid. This degree of degradation gave me a very painful impression. The Sovereign, indeed, was wearing a gown of yellow crepe lined with satin of the same shade, which I remembered having seen the Empress wear. All desire to laugh had left me. I was more inclined to weep. When the Queen was dressed, she dismissed me. I went to the salon where I found Elisa, and together we awaited the arrival of the authorities whom I was to present to Her Majesty. At this moment, a fat man with a black plaster upon his forehead passed through the salon. I recognised him for the famous Prince de la Paix. He passed impolitely before us without saluting, and we both agreed that neither his face nor his figure justified the favours which the scandalous chronicles attributed to him. The salons were then filled, and the Queen was notified. I presented to her one by one the chiefs of the administration, commencing with the Archbishop, to whom alone she addressed a word. Monsieur de Monnoir did the same for the king, who showed himself more gracious. The following day I made a visit of a quarter of an hour in the morning, and there was the usual entertainment in the evening. The day after, to my great joy, I learned of the early departure of the members of the royal family of Spain. The préfet and the archbishop came to bid them adieu. 
then we entered a carriage to go to the passage of the river for at this time there was no bridge we found there the brigantine already and the crossing effectuated i took leave of these unhappy sovereigns the unfortunate king did not have the air for a single instant of comprehending the sadness of his situation his attitude was completely lacking in dignity and seriousness during the passage of the river he had talked all the time with my servant who was on the deck he was a good german who could hardly believe that he had talked with a king he said to me afterwards mais madame il n'a donc pas de chagrin such is the history of my brief functions at the court of king charles the fourth and of the queen his horrible wife end of part two chapter eleven part two chapter twelve of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a librivox recording or librivox recordings are in the public domain eighteen hundred and eight to eighteen ten the prefecture at brussels this was the commencement of a new life i was to leave my garden my chickens my cows my flowers my regular and tranquil occupations which suited my taste to lead an entirely different existence but providence had given me the desire to endeavour always to make the best of any situation in which i found myself it was about nine o'clock in the evening as i have said when i received by messenger the note from my husband announcing his nomination as prefect of brussels when he arrived the following morning for breakfast he found me already prepared to discuss the change in our existence and the arrangements and plans which i thought we should make in consequence charlotte was then over eleven years of age very advanced for her age she had a great desire to be informed on all subjects she had immediately begun to study all the geographical dictionaries regarding belgium to examine the maps of the country and when her father who knew her well arrived and questioned her regarding the department of the deal she already knew all the statistics as for little cecile who was already a good musician at eight years of age and also a good italian scholar her first question was whether she would have a music teacher at brussels my husband immediately made all the necessary arrangements at le Buil, but unfortunately confided his affairs to a man in whom he believed he could have entire confidence to me he left the care of closing the house and the packing Monsieur de la Tour du Pin had received an order to report at Paris without delay, as Monsieur de Chabon, his predecessor, had already left Brussels to go to organise the department of Tuscany, which had just been united to the Empire. Our friend Bruquin, happier even than my husband himself over his good fortune, came to pass several days with us, and they left for Paris together the news of this nomination had surprised all those who for a long time had solicited favours without obtaining them nobody was willing to believe that the government had come to look for monsieur de la tour du pin at his plough like cincinnatus in order to give him the finest prefecture in france this choice was however the most judicious that the wonderful foresight of napoleon could have made and for the following reason brussels was a conquered capital and no effort had yet been made to attach it to france the seat of the court and of high society it had been governed up to the present time only by obscure and worthless representatives m de pontecoulon the first prefet was assuredly a man of birth and aristocratic leanings a former officer of the french guards his youth had been passed at versailles and at paris and he would perhaps have succeeded at brussels except for his wife of whom i have already spoken it was understood that she had saved his life during the terror formerly 
she had been the mistress of Mirabeau, of whom Lejai, her first husband, was the librarian. It was said that she had been pretty, but if so, she did not retain the slightest vestige of beauty. After her marriage with Monsieur de Pontecoulon, she had been frequently seen in the salon of Barras, and this did not exactly constitute a recommendation. Taken to Brussels by her husband, her antecedents had not been very attractive to the high and aristocratic society which formerly constituted the court of the Archduchess. Surrounded by French intriguers who had fallen upon Belgium as upon a prey, Monsieur de Pontecoulon did not give much time to the cares of the administration. The Emperor had recalled him, at the same time nominating him for the Senate, and had sent Monsieur de Chabon to replace him. The latter, who was an honest and enlightened man, a firm and excellent administrator, had reformed many abuses, punished breaches of trust, and dismissed the culpable parties. All his acts had been just and enlightened. It was only necessary for him to follow out this course to administer the country well. But he had not succeeded in overcoming the aloofness which the upper classes felt for the French government. This task was incumbent upon my husband, and I dare say upon me also, as the source of all influences found in the salon. It is true that Monsieur de Chabon was married, but his wife, who was sickly, insignificant, and of obscure origin, never received, and consequently nobody had ever seen her. I had been preceded at Brussels by a kind of romantic reputation, which I owed to my adventures in America. After having made all the arrangements at Le Buil and sent off by the wagon everything which we thought would be useful to us at Brussels, to diminish the very great expense of our establishment in a large mansion, I set out by post with Madame de Morville, my daughters, and my little son. A friend at Bordeaux, Monsieur Meyer, lent me a carriage which I sold for him at Brussels. En route, I passed three or four weeks at Paris with my aunt, who was then living with Monsieur de Lally in a fine house in the Rue Miroménil, which she has since sold. Madame Dillon had returned from England some time before. I went to see her, for she had received my husband very cordially when he visited Paris with Humbert the preceding year. My sister Fanny had grown up. She was then twenty-three years of age, and without being pretty had a very distinguished air. Several suitors had already presented themselves for her hand, but the one whom she would have preferred among them all, and would have married, was no longer living. This was Prince Alphonse Pignatelli, who had died of a malady of the chest. Before his death he had wished to marry Fanny so as to be able to leave her his fortune, but she had refused. As the days of the unfortunate man were numbered, she thought that it would have shown a lack of consideration on her part towards the family of Monsieur Pignatelli if she had married him at the last moment, although she loved him dearly and would have been happy even in losing him to bear his name. I also was grieved, for I should have preferred to have my sister called Pignatelli rather than Bertrand. Since this common name has come from my pen, this is the place to relate what had passed at the time of the last visit of my husband to Paris. The Emperor had repeatedly informed the Empress and Fanny herself of his wish that she should marry General Bertrand, his aide-de-camp, who was later Grand Maréchal of the Palace, who had been in love with her for a long time. My sister was not willing to consent, and the Emperor was much put out. When he learned of her preference for Alphonse Pignatelli, however, he dropped the matter. But after the death of the Prince, he took the affair up again. 
my husband was at paris just at the moment when madame dillon had promised a definite answer and she requested him to see the empress and notify her of the formal refusal of my sister the commission was quite a delicate one nevertheless he undertook it the empress received him in her bedroom with a deep alcove was closed during the day by a thick drapery of heavy material which formed a kind of wall of embroidered damask with a deep border of golden fringe she asked him to sit down beside her on a couch which was placed against the curtain as they were on tete-a-tete -tete, monsieur de la tour du pin without any circumlocution acquitted himself to the empress of the commission with which he had been charged while at the same time excusing himself for having brought a decision contrary to the wishes of the emperor as the empress continued to insist in the course of the conversation which was quite long he gave expression to very aristocratic sentiments which were not unpleasant finally after having spoken to him of himself of me of our children of his fortune of his plans the empress dismissed him my husband then went to make his report to madame dillon regarding the interview which he had just had that same evening he called on monsieur de talleyrand who took him by the arm as he was in the habit of doing when he wished to talk informally with him in a corner what possessed you he said to refuse general bertrand for your sister-in-law was that any of your affair why fanny wished it replied monsieur de la tour du pin and my age allows me to act for her as a father well said the cunning old fox fortunately you have not hurt your affair with all your aristocracy they love that at the tuileries now who then told you that demanded my husband have you seen the empress not at all replied talleyrand but i have seen the emperor who was listening to you it was perhaps this conversation overheard behind the curtain which made monsieur de la tour du pin prefet at brussels it would be difficult for me to tell with exactitude the story of my sojourn at brussels they were very fond of society there and they were much pleased to have at last a salon de prefet held by a woman who belonged to the aristocratic class there were two ladies residing at brussels who were my superiors on account of the positions occupied by their husbands the wife of the general commander of the division which had its headquarters at brussels and the wife of the first president of the imperial court seated also at brussels the first madame de chambalac had been a beautiful savoyard mademoiselle de coucy she was the aunt of monsieur de coucy whom we have known since it was said that she had been a religieuse or novice when her husband during one of the campaigns in italy carried her off and married her although forty years of age she was still quite pretty accustomed to live with military men of every kind she had acquired very common manners which however were relieved by a certain aristocratic gloss you can understand that i was neither able nor willing to associate with such a person her antecedents repelled me i always pictured her to myself attired in the costume of a hussar which she had worn it was said in order to follow her husband during several campaigns as for general de chambalac he was an imbecile who from the very first day took a hostile position regarding my husband on account of jealousy the second woman was the wife of the first president monsieur betz a learned german with much intelligence and capacity she belonged to the lowest class in the social scale although she was quite homely at the age of fifty years she might nevertheless have been pretty in her youth she was always coiffe pare decollete like a young person i received her at my house on state occasions but i do not remember ever having entered her home 
although I did not neglect to leave my card from time to time. The great jealousy of these two ladies was due to the fact that they were never invited to supper with the dowager. To be invited to these suppers was considered a mark of great distinction and formed the line of demarcation in the society of Brussels. The dowager was the Duchesse d'Aremberg, née Comtesse de Lamarck, and the last descendant of the boar of the Ardennes, Guillaume de Lamarck, born about 1436, who was decapitated in 1485. She represented, according to the words of the Archbishop of Manin, the ideal of the reine mère living in retirement in the mansion assigned to the widows of the house of aremberg she maintained there a simple but noble style and invited every day to supper a certain number of persons of every age both men and women she always dined alone went out in an open carriage in all kinds of weather and saw during the course of the day her children especially her blind son whom she tenderly loved every time that a slight indisposition caused by the gout prevented the latter from going out she did not fail to go to see him from seven to nine in the evening she received visits after that hour if any one called the swiss demanded if he had been invited to supper if the response was negative he was not admitted at this hour the guests arrived and such was the respect in which the duchesse was held that no one in brussels would have ventured to arrive at half-past nine at ten o'clock the duchesse rang and ordered the supper served after supper we played at lotto until midnight when her son was present he had a game of whist or by preference a game of backgammon with monsieur la tour du pain if he was there these reunions never comprised more than fifteen or eighteen guests, chosen from the most distinguished persons of the city, or from strangers of distinction. But the presence of strangers was rare, since France, at war with all Europe, could not be visited then as it has been since. I had often met the Duchesse d'Aremberg at Paris before the Revolution at the Hôtel de Beauvau, where I was received with great kindness. Besides this, I knew that Madame de Poire and Madame de Beauvau had written letters regarding me prior to my arrival at Brussels. The day following our arrival, I went, therefore, accompanied by my husband, to see this distinguished lady. We were received with the greatest possible kindness and invited for supper on the following day. The Duchess also expressed the wish that I should present to her my son Umbert, who had come to Brussels to meet us. This was a token of the consideration with which we were to be treated. All the members of high society hastened to inscribe their names at our house or came to see us in person. I took very particular care to return all these visits without forgetting anyone. I prepared a methodical list of all the persons who had come to call after each name i made a note of all the particulars which i had been able to gather as to the family either in conversation or from the nobility records which i procured at the burgundy library which was and is still very rich in information of this kind as assistance in this work for the present time i had m de Vesseden de varec secretary-general of the prefecture and for times past an old commander of Malta, who came to see me every evening. At the end of the month, I was as familiar with the world of Brussels as if I had lived there all my life. I knew the liaisons of every kind, the animosities, the tracasseries, and so on. Our establishment cost us a great deal of money. It seems to me my husband received a certain sum to maintain the house but i'm not sure of this the personnel of the service comprised two domestics and an employé of the bureau dressed in livery a porter a valet de chambre maître d'hôtel 
the usher of the cabinet who also waited the days of receptions and two men in the stable we occupied the palace where the king of holland has lived since the palace at that time comprised only the east wing of the present royal palace the west wing was then occupied by the hotel bellevue between the two wings was the rue heraldique which was closed in eighteen twenty six when the two wings were joined by the central colonnade my private rooms on the same floor with the state apartments were pleasant and commodious they comprised in particular a fine salon and a billiard room from the very first i announced that i would never receive in the morning under any pretext whatsoever the morning hours i devoted to the education of my daughters helping them in their lessons and going out with them for promenades either on foot or in a carriage we soon became intimate with a number of persons my husband met again with pleasure the comte de liedekerk one of his old companions in arms before the revolution in the regiment of the royal comtois of which monsieur de la tour du pin had been the colonel en seconde the comte de liedekerk had married mademoiselle des Antoines, who was heiress to an immense fortune of which she already possessed a considerable part they had only one son florent charles auguste and two daughters the young man then twenty-two years of age was auditeur of the council of state as there was talk of attaching one of these auditors to the person of each prefet in order to give these young men an acquaintance with the administration and with the idea of employing them as secretaries in the private cabinet of the prefet monsieur de liedekerk requested monsieur de la tour du pin his former colonel to give his son such a post our son Humbert had left antwerp where monsieur malouet had been to him a second father and returned to brussels to take up the preparatory studies which were necessary for his examination for the council of state which was to take place in several months during the month of september eighteen hundred and eight i received a letter from my stepmother madame dillon she informed me that my sister had finally decided after much hesitation and uncertainty to marry general bertrand she had been overcome in part by his constancy and in part by the persistency of the emperor to whom you could refuse nothing as he used so much charm and fascination in obtaining what he desired my sister at that time was extremely frivolous with the frivolity of a creole like her mother napoleon had desired that she should accompany the empress josephine to fontainebleau and in order to enable her to appear to advantage he had sent her thirty thousand francs to cover the expenses of her wardrobe during the week that the court was to be there at this time he finally succeeded in obtaining her assent to the proposed union which he had refused so obstinately the emperor decided that the marriage should take place at once in spite of the objection raised by my sister that her mother had just lost her daughter poor madame de fitzjames the emperor in face of these attempts at delay and judging that the two women if left to themselves would never come to a decision said to fanny have your sister come she will arrange everything i am leaving for erfurt in a week the marriage must take place before then i was advised by a letter from the duc de bassano for neither madame dillon nor fanny thought to write me although the letter was very pleasant it had very much the air of an order and the thought of refusing did not enter my mind two hours after i received it i was on my way to paris at daybreak i arrived at the house of madame dinin who was stupefied on awakening to find me beside her bed she always kept a room at our disposal in her pretty mansion of the rue de meromenil where she then lived i remained with my aunt only long enough to change my gown and to send for a carriage 
then having taken a cup of tea i went to see madame dillon rue joubert there i learned that she had been for several days in the country not far from saint cloud with madame de boigne she had left no word for me i then demanded the name and the route to take to this house and immediately set out again after having written a line to the duc de bassano to announce to him my arrival after a trip of an hour and a half i arrived at Beauregard, the house of madame de boigne above malmaison half-past eleven was striking when i arrived and madame dillon was still in bed fanny cried now we are saved here is my sister her mother on the contrary was seized with fright at the idea of the activity which my energy would impart to her she had thought of nothing i began by advising her to get up dress take breakfast and then return to paris with my sister and myself at this moment general bertrand arrived until then i had never met him and he probably knew that my husband had been charged by madame dillon with the task of refusing his marriage propositions two years before as he was naturally extremely timid he was very much embarrassed in order to put him at his ease i proposed to him a walk in the park while awaiting the moment when madame dillon should be dressed during this promenade which lasted an hour we came to such a complete understanding that on returning to the house all was arranged without entering into long details i will say that the following morning everything was ready and the signature of the contract was fixed for the next evening this was accomplished at the mairie the grand juge regnier was awakened at five o'clock in the morning to have expedited i know not what act which had to serve as a certificate of baptism for my sister as madame dillon had lost the one which she possessed if she ever had one even the most diligent courier would not have been able to go to Avene in flanders where my sister was born and return by the day destined by napoleon for the marriage the emperor had also insisted that the ceremony should take place at saint mulleux at the chateau of queen hortense he was very careful to carry out in all particulars the orders given by the emperor for the ceremony thus at the moment when he was going to assemble around him all the potentates who were then at his feet the great man had found the time to regulate the minutest details of the celebration of the marriage of his favourite aide-de-camp i was presented to the emperor by madame de bassano at saint cloud towards eight o'clock in the morning it was necessary for me to go to her house in court costume with a plume toque the emperor received me in the most gracious manner asked me many questions regarding brussels the society la haute societe with a smile which seemed to say vous n'aimez que cela then he laughed at having made me get up so early in the morning and made a little fun of madame de bassano on this subject a mockery which she took with a little sulky air which was very becoming to her she has since told me that the emperor at that time was quite smitten with her the great ones of the earth arrived with their wives the clauses of the marriage contract were read but i do not remember the details although i think they were favourable to my sister fanny that day appeared to very great advantage the evening which preceded the day of the marriage passed in a very tiresome manner the dejeuner the next day was not more amusing the marriage was to take place at half past three all the ashi arrived the marshals the generals and so on we marched in a procession to the chapel the abbe dosmond bishop of nancy later archbishop of florence gave the nuptial benediction then the dinner was served and after dinner we danced many young people came from paris 
Queen Hortense, who loved to dance, nevertheless was in bad humour on account of a little incident which was quite amusing. The Emperor had not appeared, but he had intimated to Queen Hortense that, after having examined the set of emeralds surrounded by diamonds which the Empress had given Fanny, he did not think it was sufficient. As he knew that Hortense had a similar set, he requested her to add hers to that given by her mother in order to complete the gift. She did not expect anything of this kind and was very much displeased, but it was necessary to submit. End of Part 2, Chapter 12「Part II, Chapter Thirteen of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1810 to 1811. Visit of the Emperor. I returned to Brussels after several grand dinners given in honour of the marriage, which were very boring. I set out with joy to be again with my husband and my children. The autumn and the winter passed quite agreeably at Brussels. I gave two or three handsome balls. Madame de Duras came with her daughters to pass two weeks with us. I gave them dances and took them to the theatre in the excellent box of the prefecture. They had a very good time. Queen Hortense had passed through Brussels in the course of the last journey which she made to rejoin her husband for a period of several days at Amsterdam. I saw her when she went through, and she expressed a great boredom over the necessity of going to resume her duties as Queen. As I have no pretension of writing history, I will not speak of the marriage of the Emperor Napoleon with the Archduchess Marie-Louise, I will only report what my sister told me regarding the arrival of this princess at Compiègne. The emperor was then at Compiègne with the new ladies of honour of the empress, and was in a state of boundless impatience to see his new wife. A little caleche was waiting all hitched up in the court of the chateau to take him to meet her. When the advance courier came, Napoleon rushed to the caleche and set out to meet the Berlin which was bringing the spouse so much desired. The carriage stopped, the door was opened, and Marie-Louise prepared to descend. But her husband did not give her the time. He entered the Berlin, embraced his wife, and then, having pushed her sister the Queen of Naples without the ceremony onto the front seat of the carriage, he seated himself beside Marie-Louise. Arriving at the chateau, he descended first, offered her his arm, and conducted her to the Salon de Service, where all the invited guests were assembled. It was already evening. The emperor presented, one after another, all the ladies of the mansion, and then the men. This presentation over, he took the empress by the hand and conducted her to her apartment. All of us thought that the empress was proceeding with her toilette. We waited for an hour, and then commenced to be very anxious to have our supper. At this moment the Grand Chamberlain came to announce that their majesties had retired. The surprise was great, but no one ventured to let it be seen, and we went to supper. This marriage with an archiduchesse was celebrated at Brussels with great rejoicing. The recollections of the Austrian domination were far from being effaced. The nobility of Brussels, which until then had kept aloof from the new government, attracted now by the good administration of a préfet of the aristocratic class, found the moment favourable to lay aside its former antipathy, which had commenced to be irksome. When Monsieur de la Tour du Pin learned that the Emperor was going to bring the young Empress to the capital of the ancient possessions of her father in Belgium, he created a guard of honour to form the service at the Chateau of Lacaine. 
This guard was composed entirely of Belgians, to the exclusion of all French. The uniform was very simple, a green coat with amaranthine breeches. It was a cavalry corps and very well mounted. My sister came to Brussels and stayed with us at the prefecture. She was present at the grand dinner which we gave in honour of this guard, at which the ladies were adorned with ribbons of the same colours as the uniform. The emperor arrived at Laken for dinner. The next day he received the guard of honour and all the officials. The mayor, the Duc d'Urcel, presented the municipal authorities to him. In the evening there was an assembly at which I presented the ladies, nearly all of whom I knew. Marie-Louise did not address a personal word to any of them. The name of the most illustrious lady present, for example, the Duchesse d'Arenberg or the Comtesse de Merode, meant no more to her ear than that of Madame P., wife of the Receiver-General. After the assembly, I had the honour of playing a game of whist with Her Majesty. The Duc d'Urcel named the cards which I must throw upon the table, and warned me when it was my turn to deal. This kind of comedy lasted half an hour. After this, the Emperor having retired, we separated, and I was charmed to return home. The following day there was to be a grand ball at the Hôtel de Ville. I was therefore somewhat put out when I was invited to dinner at La Ken, as I did not well see how I could find a moment to change my toilette, or at least my gown, between the dinner and the ball. However, the pleasure of seeing and listening to the Emperor during a period of two hours was so great that I could not but appreciate the value of such an invitation. The Duc d'Urcel accompanied me, and as we were to go afterwards to the Hôtel de Ville to receive the Emperor, I ordered my femme de chambre to be there with another toilette already. This dinner was one of the events of my life of which I have preserved the most agreeable recollection. Here is the way in which the guests to the number of eight, were placed at the table. The Emperor, at his right, the Queen of Westphalia, then Maréchal Bertier, the King of Westphalia, the Empress, the Duc d'Urcel, Madame de Bouillet, finally myself at the left of the Emperor. He talked to me nearly all the time, regarding the manufactures, the laces, the daily wages, the life of the lace-makers, then of the monuments, the antiquities, the establishments of charity, the manners of the people, the Beguines. Fortunately, I was well posted regarding all of these subjects. The Emperor demanded of the Duc d'Urcel, What are the wages of a lace-maker? The poor man was embarrassed in the endeavour to express the sum in centimes. The Emperor saw his hesitation and, turning to me, asked, what is the name of the money of the country? I replied, an escalin, or sixty-three centimes. Ah, c'est bien, said he. We did not remain more than three-quarters of an hour at table. On returning to the salon, the emperor took a large cup of coffee and began again to talk. First he spoke of the toilette of the empress, which he admired. Then, changing the topic, he asked me if I found my lodging satisfactory. Pas mal, I replied, dans l'appartement de votre majesté. Ah, vraiment, said he, il a coûté assez cher pour cela. C'est ce coquin de, le nom m'échappe, le secrétaire de Monsieur Pontécoulon qui l'a fait arranger. The emperor then turned to an entirely different subject of conversation, he spoke of Charles the Bold, Duc de Bourgogne, and of Louis XI, from whom he descended quite abruptly to Louis the Fourteenth, saying that he had never been really great except in his latter years. Observing with what interest I listened to him, and that I understood him, 
he returned to Louis XI and expressed himself thus. J'ai mon avis sur celui-là, et je sais bien que ce n'est pas l'avis de tout le monde. After several words regarding the shame of the reign of Louis XV, he pronounced the name of Louis XVI, upon which, stopping with an air at once respectful and sad, he said, Ce malheureux prince. At this moment, someone announced that it was necessary to set out for the ball. Monsieur Dursel and I rushed to the carriage, and the horses at a gallop brought us to the Hotel de Ville. I went up four steps at a time. A toilette, which was already, awaited me. I changed my costume and was able to be in the ballroom when the Emperor arrived. He paid me a compliment on my promptitude and asked me if I intended to dance. I replied, no, because I am forty years old. At this he began to laugh, saying, there are many others who dance who do not reveal their age like that. The ball was very fine and was prolonged after the supper, where everybody drank to the health of the Empress. The Emperor and his wife left the following morning. A yacht, highly decorated, took them to the end of the Canal of Brussels, where they found the carriages which conveyed them to Antwerp. On boarding the yacht, my husband noticed the Marquis de Trasigny, the commander of the Guard of Honour. Fearing that the Emperor would not invite him to take a place on the yacht, where there was only room for a few persons, he named him, at the same time adding, his ancestor was constable under St. Louis. These words produced a magic effect on the Emperor, who immediately summoned the Marquis de Trasigny and had a long talk with him. A short time later, his wife was named Dame du Palais, she pretended to be displeased over this nomination, although secretly she was delighted. After this trip of the Emperor, we resumed the ordinary train of our life at Brussels. The summer passed in visiting different country houses where we were invited to dine. We went to Antwerp to be present at the launching of a large vessel of 74, one of the new ones at that moment on the slipways. Our excellent friend Monsieur Malloway was at the head of this work through his position as préfet maritime. All the details of these constructions interested me in the highest degree. Our son Humbert went to Paris to pass his examination. It was a very trying thing for a young man of twenty years to reply to a whole series of questions which were asked him, but it was even more so when the emperor, seated in an armchair with the candidate standing before him, took up the examination and asked you a lot of unexpected things. Humbert heard the examiner say in the ear of Napoleon, in pointing him out, this is one of the most distinguished. And this good word comforted him. The emperor asked him if he knew any foreign language, to which he replied, English and Italian, as well as French. It was the facility with which he spoke Italian that decided his nomination as sous-préfet at Florence. Towards the end of the winter of 1810 and 1811, we went, my husband and I, to pass two months at Paris to accompany our son Humbert, who was setting out for Florence. My sister Fanny was at Paris with her two children, of whom the younger, little Hortense, was only three months old. We had left at Brussels Madame Denine, my two daughters, and Monsieur Lally, who passed for an English prisoner. He was very anxious not to lose this position in order to preserve the pension of three hundred pounds sterling which was paid him on that account by the English government. My dear Humbert left for Florence. This departure, the beginning of a long absence, was very painful to me. I was his friend as well as his mother. I was therefore desirous of returning at once to Brussels, 
but my husband did not think it advisable to leave paris before the birth of the imperial child which was expected at any moment one evening i was invited to an entertainment given at the tuileries in a little gallery where a theatre had been improvised we assembled in the salon of the empress the emperor came directly to me with an extreme kindness he spoke to me first of my son then he exclaimed regarding the simplicity of my dress my good taste and my distinguished air to the great surprise of several ladies covered with diamonds who were asking each other who this newcomer could possibly be when we entered the gallery i was placed upon a bench very near that of the emperor the play l'avocat patelin was performed by some admirable actors the piece which was very comical amused napoleon very much and he laughed heartily the presence of the great man did not prevent me from doing the same this pleased him very much as he said afterwards in mocking the ladies who thought it necessary to maintain their gravity it was considered a great favour to be invited to this spectacle and only about fifty ladies were present the morning of the twentieth of march eighteen eleven we heard the first discharge of the guns of the invalides everyone rushed into the street all the carriages stopped the merchants upon the thresholds of their shops the people at their windows counted the strokes we heard everyone say three four five and so on there was an interval of about a minute between each discharge after the twenty-first there was a profound silence but at the twenty-second there were spontaneous cries of vive l'empereur that evening i dined with my sister madame bertrand and there we were notified that the child would be privately baptized at nine o'clock and that the ladies who had been presented at court could attend the ceremony madame dillon my sister and i went we had to enter by the pavillon de flore and pass through all the apartments as far as the salle des marichaux the salons were full of the dignitaries of the empire men and women everyone endeavoured to be at the edge of the passageway kept open by the ushers where the procession was to pass to descend to the chapel we managed to manoeuvre so as to find ourselves on the landing of the stairway from this point we enjoyed a very rare sight that of the old grogna of the vieille guard arranged in order upon each step everyone wearing the cross upon his breast they were forbidden to make a movement but a very vivid emotion was depicted upon their stern faces and i saw tears of joy in their eyes the emperor appeared at the sight of madame de montesquieu who bore the child with his face uncovered upon a cushion of white satin covered with lace i had the opportunity to obtain a good look at him End of part two, chapter thirteen